Introducing the new DigiCert as the leading provider of high assurance SSL, TLS, and PKI certificates, DigiCert is all about improving security across the web and IoT. DigiCert is committed to helping customers and partners successfully deploy identity, authentication, and encryption solutions. They'll even help you figure out which certificate you need to secure your web domains, apps, devices, and more. Check out the Cert Wizard tool under the SSL tab on digicert.com. The average time between being hacked and realizing you've been hacked is one year. Can you afford to let an intruder roam your network for that long? Can your company weather the fallout when this comes to light? Black Hills Information Security can find the bad guys in your network and train you to do it yourself. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a hunt teaming engagement can help you find a persistent threat in your network. Signal Sciences is the industry's first web protection platform that works in any cloud, any container, any platform as a service, and any modern application architecture. Architecture. The Signal Sciences web protection platform can be deployed in next generation WAF, RASP, or reverse proxy modes, giving customers ultimate flexibility and coverage. Protect your web applications with Signal Sciences web protection platform. Signal Sciences, protecting applications, connecting teams. For more information, check them out at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. Welcome back. Before we get on this next segment, how do you feel about user and entity behavior analytics? What about your SIM? Check out our webcast with Logarithm, where we unveil our results from our most recent survey on June 14th at 3 to 4 p.m. All right, now the new segment. So, you know, as you guys know, Paul's not here. So he said, oh, don't worry, I'll get you some news articles. Uh, he sent us 15. I don't think we want to be here all <laughs> night. So uh, let, let's... Let's get to the ones that yeah, are most and interesting. For the record, he doesn't get them. He has uh, he has something that goes out and scrapes and finds them. Yes, so it's all, it's it's all automated. I, well, it's mostly yeah. automated. I actually asked him, is, th is that a container-based service that goes out and does this for you? He said, no, it's not quite that um, automated yet, but yes. He, ta he taught his sex bot to do it. <laughs> He did have one article in that here about makes so much sense. Yeah, sex with robots, and I'm gonna skip that one unless you guys. Do it. it was a whole thing about hygiene. I mean, it was like <laughs> it was like how to clean your sex robot and three easy oh, steps. Oh gosh, no! With, with pictures of Paul doing it. I really it. want to hear Doug talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously he read that one. I skipped it. Well, I saw sex robots, and it was like, okay, I'm there, dude. All right, if you want to cover. No, it, no, 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 it's okay. I, I, I it's okay. You got to cover. <laughs> something else <laughs> do whatever you have to do like, let on. people come on sex Doug you're, you're Larry tonight come let on, people Doug. sex robots get all nasty it's like <laughs> I, I mean I, I I understand no I I've read all those I I keep seeing those they're, they're I mean BBC has them you know like, like they're interviewing the people no really like really? BBC had a video series about sex robots and they were talking to the pe sex robots and the people who use them sex robots and the people who clean them you know and it, you know it was just kind of like that and I, I mean like it's a new business idea you could have a service like i go around and i clean sex robots for people there was there was a model where you could put various parts of it in the dishwasher and clean them so they would be really hygienic yeah. and there was the grossest story of all you're gonna like this one the grossest one i saw was about a sex robot bordello so you you not only it's not only it's a sex robot it's like you rent a sex robot and you have it for a little while and then they give it to somebody else. And, you know, I will say, I will say this, just a, it's sort of, I guess, a personality test. The one thing about me, the whole time I was watching these, it wasn't about this is wrong or this is weird or whatever. It was all about, I feel so damn sorry for these, like, robots. <laughs> I mean, the robot was sitting there like, please kill me, please, please kill me. Because the people they were interviewing were just, you know, I mean, I don't care what you do with, with your sex robot, but I felt sorry for them. Oh, gosh. She was just like sitting there like, hello, like, hello Wendy. Like, I, feel like, hello. I, I feel like we've officially gone off the rails. We <laughs> have. Totally lost control. You, you this is what happens when you put the two of us yeah, in the chair. Like, let me all sit right, in Larry's chair. It's let, all over. Let's go to the security news okay. to stay away from the, the sex stuff. All right. So the first one I pulled up. Uh, says, update Google Chrome immediately to patch a high severity vulnerability. Doesn't like they say doesn't Chrome day. update itself? <laughs> yeah, you have to restart. It though. should. Yeah, it can, but if you leave all your browser windows open, it doesn't. Oh, so, so I got to reboot my browser. Yeah, I can, oh, I'll kill it after the show. Well, yeah, if you turn it, if you reboot the machine or kill the browser, you're fine. But, oh, okay. But yeah, Google doesn't do that automatically. It I just oh, well, it, it, it does the update in the background. It downloads yeah. it and then it just sort of sits there and waits, and then until you happen to notice that it's like lit up and you know. Oh, it says. 
Restart me. Your screen Restart is flashing, me. you know, send $7,500 in Bitcoin to... <laughs> and they didn't even give <laughs> many details on this... Um, on this one, they yeah, without yeah, revealing any dark. Yeah, it's really like nebulous. Like, well, what's what's going on here? But uh -huh. they're like, quick, you got to update it immediately. Uh -huh. And I was like, wait, I thought I thought Chrome kind of updated itself in the background. But yeah, okay. those those are the scary ones my, too. My gut feeling is that like what will happen is someone will go in and reverse engineer this in the next week, maybe mm -hmm. two, and then know what this vulnerability actually is uh, based on the actual patch. That got it. Okay. Well, it looks like. And it looks like the issue is that um, they made some kind of they found some kind of screw up in how it handled content security policies. Yeah, it and was CPS, because of yeah. that, um, you could potentially attackers could have an easier time of getting you with cross site scripting and things right. like that. Yeah, they actually somebody had 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 done that already. They had gone. I read it. I read it was like the CPS the stuff. So got it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they didn't get into the details probably because they don't want somebody to hurry up and build an exploit for it. Pretty much. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. So. Next, because lots of sites have cross-site scripting on them, so uh, being number one browser and use the world, con you know, content security policy bypasses plus XSS on a bad day for a lot of people. Got it. And at the end of the article, it says Firefox has also released its new version of Firefox web browser, um, which includes a bunch of security fixes. So I wondered if they had maybe the maybe, same vulnerability, <laughs> same vulnerability, or something similar in in their browser. But anyways. Well, we could have some of the 19 or 20 Firefox users on the show and just talk to them about <laughs> it and find out. You know, believe it or not, Doug, though, I actually use Firefox for bounty hunting because it has just better plugins. To, it does. To it's it's a good them. product, and I, I have used it. I, I just I always kind of migrate through them, and, and except for Explorer, which I only use oh, to right. install Chrome like everybody else. But, <laughs> I mean, I, I have just kind of <laughs> down through time have, you know, have been... You know, like I go to Firefox and I get frustrated with it, and I switch to right. switch to Chrome, and then because you're a Windows guy, see, I have to start with Safari to download oh, my Chrome yeah, and then exactly. put Safari away. <laughs> yeah, I always, so can I, I always... actually segue to Safari for just a moment. Uh, I, how many of you guys caught the Worldwide Developer Conference from Apple last week? I uh, no. this week early. No, nope. I was. I was yeah, not. I watched it. Part of it anyway. I watched so part of it. One of the things that they actually came out with in Safari, or they're coming out with in Safari for Mojave, which is their new operating system release. Is they're actually going to be blocking by default all of the tracking that takes place from like buttons or comment fields or mm. any number of other things that take place inside of the browser, which is a follow-on to what Firefox is doing. So believe it or not, I mean, Chrome doesn't do that yet. And I don't think that Chrome ever really will because, let's face it, that's not the model that Google operates off of. Um, Safari very well may become my default browser going forward. Hmm. Interesting. You know, I turned I turned Safari off. I was having a lot of issues with it just sucking up lots of memory and other stuff. I I just I just pff, I killed it. I said I can't do this anymore. I mean, it was just it was killing my Mac. Anyways, <laughs> all right. Number two that I pulled was uh, Marcus Hutchins, wanna cry killer, hit with four new charges by the FBI, and this is related to some of his previous kind of malware um, uh, attacks. You guys probably know the story heck of a lot better than I do. But uh, yeah, they just charged him with with some more well, stuff. He, you write that malware, you go into jail. Yeah, I mean, but I they can I don't know if they can prove that he wrote it. I mean, that's that's going to be the thing is where he can back. I mean, I don't know I don't know the innards of the case. I just know the outards, and and the outards of the case are that he his defense can be that he says it was out in the wild, prove that I wrote it, and of course theoretically anyway the FBI can do that since they arrested him for it. So. Right. In theory, anyway, they have evidence that he did it. And there's another actor that's involved in it called Vinny K. And so supposedly Malware Tech and Vinny K wrote all this malware and released it. And now they're just sort of slowly finding the malwares that they've released or sold. These, these were actually sold. Yeah, they uh, were sold. Yeah. Yeah. So who Thanks. knows? I mean, but, you know, so he's got a problem. Yeah, he definitely does. It, it makes One me wonder eight. how much of this is evidence uncovered from dark markets that they have effectively um, taken down and now have log files from and can and trace that back. Because to have, you know, almost a year later since his arrest, right? Like we're going on like 10 or 11 months at this point. To have yeah. him have new charges brought up now as a result of what is ostensibly further investigation is interesting, right? Because it's almost like a situation of they're thinking where there's smoke, there's fire. So they try to catch him on one thing. They get subpoenas to look at evidence, uh, including evidence collected from some of those like dark markets, uh, like Silk Road, et cetera, that they've you know managed to shut down in some fashion. And then 
you know, trace back the timeline accordingly and then try to pin this on Marcus Hutchins. It'll be interesting but, to see, you know, in court, especially what sort of discovery comes out of yeah. this in terms of that. But sometimes that process does work like that because once they seize his initial group of things and start examining all that, they find ties to these other things, which give them links back to the Russians and then Putin. No, wait, I'm sorry. I'm thinking about it, somebody else. But, um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, exactly. Well, well it, sometimes, it, 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 and I'm not saying this is the trial. case, maybe the FBI might have overextended themselves yeah. and they're, they're trying to, you know, they're in the midst of a, you know, CYA ex exercise where they got to find something on this guy because they arrested him. Yeah. I, I don't know that that's the case. Yeah. Maybe they didn't have enough evidence on the original case and they had to keep digging and they found this and they're can continue to bolster the case. A couple, well, couple of tasers and a bright light. We'll have it all in an hour. Yeah, we gave up waterboarding. So on. Well, yeah, you could do you could do electrical waterboarding, which yeah, is okay. even better. <laughs> all right. One of the charges he's been hit with on the new edition is is uh, they're saying that he lied to the FBI after they arrested him and they were doing <laughs> his investigation. Um, so it's not all. I mean, like one of the things I guess is he's he supposedly created a second piece of malware. Yep. And he was arrested. He he lied when he uh, was arrested by the FBI. Perjury will get you every time. That's right. And tax evasion. Perjury but will get I, I don't know. It, it, it sounded thin to well, me. If I recall well, the case correctly, it was something like 24 hours at least since the time that he was arrested to the time that he actually had contact with the outside world in terms of a lawyer. Um, if, if there's any sets of evidence or any even chains of evidence that are going to ultimately be thrown out of this case as a result of uh, you know the way in which this has initially been handled and that of course, the way in which this is uh, proceeded now going forward. The fruit of the poison tree. That's that's a good one. That's a good one. The fruit of the poison tree. That's that's a legal term. Oh, got it. In forensics. Really? Yeah. In forensics, we talk about... You don't know what it is? No. Oh, the fruit of the poison tree means that, like, uh, I get a piece of tainted evidence... And I use that tainted evidence to arrest oh. you. And then that leads to a warrant that I go and I break in the house and find the 72 bodies you have buried in the basement. But even though I found the 72 bodies in the basement because the warrant's tainted because the first warrant was tainted, all the evidence gets thrown out under the fruit of the poison tree. Fruit of the poison tree, baby. Glad we have a lawyer here. We'll need you. I'm not a lawyer. Oh, no, I'm not a lawyer. It's like, uh-uh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the legal side. Yes, yeah, so make sure that we... We cover that. I don't think any of us on this show are a lawyer. Today, oh, no, I certainly no. am. We have a bag of wooden <laughs> stakes back there in case some show up. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking something else when you said taint. But, yeah, I'm, just trying, I'm just trying to channel Larry. Okay, back to the sex robots. Oh, uh, God. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, <laughs> so I, I, I think Jeff may take one on, on this next story. Federal agencies face an uphill <laughs> battle in cyber preparedness. Um, really? <laughs> you, you think? You think? Have we done anything since OPM or anything? No. Um, do they cite the OPM in this at all? Please they, tell me. They they, the they do. They say in the wake of the elimination of the federal cybersecurity czar position, the latest federal cybersecurity preparedness report from the Office Management and Budget Department Homeland Security. You know, seventy four percent of agencies lagging. I don't think they mentioned OPM specifically, mm -hmm. but um, anyways, it, it's just. It's proof that we have not made much progress on the federal side when it comes to the the cybersecurity stuff. And, and I stuck a story in because of that. Uh, I stuck a story in about that that was that was from Rhode Island. So over the weekend in Rhode Island, three agencies were compromised, and there was a very vague story. And a bunch of press people called me and asked me questions about it, which I didn't know the answers to. And they still haven't revealed, you know, what went on. Uh, there was a quote where the, I don't know, was a, the CTO or CSO or somebody said uh, it was some generic phishing attack or something like that, that all these different departments, but that no data was compromised. And they still not revealed what, what went on. And I know it was being investigated and all this stuff. So, I, I, I mean, I, you see that over and over again. However, to be fair, corporate, it's a lot easier to keep anybody from seeing these things happening. Whereas in these public service agencies, that information tends to get revealed and, and they get a lot of flack. But yeah, I don't think they've, they've, I mean, they don't get any budget for it. Mm -hmm. We get mandates passed, so, but then so it's like, where's the budget? Yeah, where's no money? What I, what well, I find most interesting my, though is my, at, in one breath, they can both cover this, which is that they are not ready to deal with any sort of breach of their systems. And in the second breath, say that we need backdoors to encryption that they can hold key escrow on. <laughs> 
<laughs> it, it absolutely blows my mind that they can just totally forget about this entire problem set, which is why things like key escrow, by the way, will not work. The federal government is not prepared to handle what it has today, let alone the back doors to everybody's devices everywhere. Uh, and, and so it, it just totally blows me away that we can actually see these things come out of the DHS and then the FBI, which is, you know, the other arm of the government that's saying we need to be able to break encryption. I don't know that I have enough faith in the federal government's budgeting abilities to fix this problem, let alone their technical abilities. Son, have you ever used that Ooh. internet thing? Go ahead, Jeff. I'm I sorry. know you got not, not, not on too this, many Jeff. rabbit holes that we've opened here. <laughs> so as a segue, my, my lone quote-unquote news story of the week, which isn't a news story because the event actually happened last October and I recently became aware of it, uh, but an interesting uh, set of videos to watch. There was a, a symposium that was held last fall uh, at the University of Maryland University College uh, called Cyber at the Crossroads. And one of the panel discussions was they got a bunch of the big wigs from back in the day, back in my day, uh, to get together and talk about this thing that was called Eligible Receiver 97, which was the first uh, coordinated... Uh, joint forces hack that NSA performed. It was a co coordinated red team exercise and it was and they subtitle the the panel discussion it was it was a wake-up call for the DoD to say that we need to take this thing that we now call cyber attacks seriously because it could impact our armed forces. So interesting discussion and an interesting sort of backward segue because 20 some years ago, uh, the government, government, the DoD was unprepared, but for different reasons. And uh, you know, it, you know, we could probably spend hours talking about, you know, what went wrong and what continues to go wrong. Uh, you know, and and a lot of it has to do with, uh, in my opinion, uh, sort of, you know, the entity that used to know security was the DoD, but it was radio signals, it was hardware based and even and especially when i was there and it's mentioned in in these talks that the part of this crossroads element was uh, this agency that was um very committed to hardware solutions was running smack into the technological advancements where so many things were becoming more software based and network based and in some ways have never really um gotten on board with that successfully or, or not been able to keep up. You know, the good news is we don't do it too well in, in the commercial sector either with, you know, with you know, rare exceptions, you know, big companies that do it right, get it right, have people on board that are knowledgeable enough to do it right and get it right. And I think the collective problem, whether it's in government or it's in the private sector, is this belief that if you throw enough money at it, the problem will be solved. And, of course, there's limited budgets in the commercial world, and it's got to be revenue-based and financial model-based. But in the government, it's, it's, it's been harder because of limited budgets and, and being able to attract and keep and train the right types of resources. That, that, so it's that an endemic the, problem. That and the lack of under I, I see this stuff where, like, I, in one of these reports about this I was reading, and, and what they do is, is they write this huge report, right? So they write this huge thing, and OMB sends it to DHS, who sends it to FBI, and then they come back and they go to some department, you know, like the Department of Ferrets and, and Wolverines or something like that. And they say, at the Department of Ferrets and Wolverines, you have a serious problem. Use the NIST framework, and all your problems will be solved. And they hand them this giant document from NIST. Not, nothing wrong with the document. It's a perfectly reasonable document, but they hand it to them and they say, no budget, no people, no additional personnel, just fix it. Here's the NIST framework, knock yourself out. And we don't want to see any more trouble down at, at Wolverines and Ferrets because that's been an embarrassment and we're going to fire the director and replace him with this person who, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, budgets uh, have definitely been a challenge, but then you have, um, look, the joke used to be, you know, the financial guys would hire the guys from the government and then everybody would go try to poach the guys out of the financials right to to get the skill set right so yeah. you know it, we're definitely you know people have definitely been poached out of the uh, out of the federal government to come into the commercial space because they can make more money so yeah yeah i mean you so see one of the salaries? interesting things i thought with this article as well is that um the report started, states flat out that cios and cso's 
don't have authority to make decisions for their organization either. So they can even see the problem, see what they want to do, and they're not allowed to do anything. Very true. Got to love our government. Seen that? Well, that happens to the private sector too, though. So. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. It's not limited to the feds. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. All right. I think we beat that horse enough. All right. Uh, next one. Microsoft just put a data center on the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, that won't have a problem. This was so cool. I thought it this was pretty cool. cool. No, it looks Well, awesome. I like it because it says the shipping container sized data center holds 864 servers completely powered by renewable energy. Mm hmm. But then they had to reboot it, and it was just... You know, <laughs> as long as it doesn't blue screen, right? Yeah, like the whole thing <laughs> B-shot it. Yeah. That's going to be a Most hell of a service thing, like, call when they have to send an engineer out. The first update, yeah, it's exactly. over. It's like we need 50 <laughs> divers. They're going to have to go down for a week and then reboot. Yeah, it's going to an update because there was this thing. Most expensive what hard drive What I found really great about this, ever. though, is, is they actually talk about like deployment of data centers, right? So on land, it takes something like two years to build and deploy a data center. So that's including things like cooling, getting the building yeah. right, getting the ventilation right, getting the server racked in place, et cetera, electricity, yada, yada. This is a 90-day solution. And mm -hmm. the other thing that they point out in the article is that in the deep ocean, the effects that you see from either wars or hurricanes or yeah. tornadoes, earthquakes just aren't experienced the same way. Now, the, uh, the problem which, with so Bond works. villains and octopus attacks have gone way up, but <laughs> but yeah, all that other stuff's good. Uh, the other thing I liked about this was not just the shrinkage of the time from two years to 90 days, but they could put these things pretty much anywhere, yeah. right? So if you want to talk about, try to build a data center in New York, right? But what if I just dropped one in the Hudson or, right? Or, right? It, it gives or them put this. Put it on a balloon and hang it up over, you know, like <laughs> well, Midtown. This is supposed to <laughs> post well, go yeah, If you can put it at the bottom of the ocean, you can put it up in the sky. I mean, you know, it's like, why not? But it gave them the ability to deploy data centers near populations really efficiently without needing yeah. to worry about the build out of the data center. You have highly densely populated cities like Singapore and others where. Building a data center would be really, really hard. This is like just drop Literally, it off the shore. Drop it offshore. Shoot yeah. it out there with a cannon. Yeah, uh, yeah but how uh -oh. are you going to convince people that there's a cloud underwater? <laughs> <laughs> Got to change the term. Isn't clouds just made of water? They're just made of water, guys. Very have to call water. them storms or something. It's like Ooh. the effect after the, the rain cloud, Ooh. after the cloud. Maybe fog. It's, it, well, fog is used in edge computing now. Oh, yeah. So you have cloud, so, so edge, and this layer in the middle. They the call humidity. fog. So you can't humidity? use fog. It's already used. Okay. Humidity. It's like storm. So I've, got a, I've got a joke for you. Uh -oh. I've got a joke for you. What do you call a school of data centers? Oh, God. <laughs> Fish. I give up. Oh. <laughs> Fish. You're bad. It's you're like a, you're a bad man. Oh. A bad man. <clears throat> All right, we done with that. Like it. No, that's, it's good though. I liked it. I, really I did. did. I liked that. I, I liked article. it. I, I liked the that design. I thought it was really cool. It was very innovative and and unique. And I agree with you. It's like the ability to say in 90 days I can drop a massive data center. I don't know, just offshore, and and I don't have to go buy a building in Manhattan and try to fix it up. Yeah, and just put it in the Hudson. But, but, ser but seriously, Are we how is the thing? Okay, I get that it's powered with renewable energy and all that, but. How is it connected to things? Is there a hardwire connection somewhere? Uh, no, can I, it be cut? It must be undersea cable. It's got to yeah. be yeah, maybe undersea cable, but I, I, I don't know. I thought it was a cable. Was so it? it had a cable attached. So it's just like a big long thing, and then they, you know, they, they take it out there and drop it off the ship, and the cable runs back to land, and they wire it in. That was my impression of it. Look yeah. at it. I didn't get that far in the article. So, yeah. that, so that's where the James the Bond scenario might come in. How do uh -huh. they protect against somebody going yeah. out and just cutting the cable? Uh, absolutely, or, or just you know right. picking up the data center and stealing it. I mean, I mean, you could it could be the law of the sea, and you salvage the damn thing. So you just go out there and grab it and f drive off with drive it, off with like it. the Russian trawler gets <laughs> yeah. it, and it's in a fishing net, yep. and they haul it back to like Blofeld's Island, and and they can they got the whole data center. Or, or right a there. Russian sub goes and hooks it up and yeah. grabs it and pulls it out. Beep beep beep. <laughs> and, and the, the Microsoft other people. I have is go ahead. Well, that also begs the question: Is it in international waters? Today. Is it salvageable? And we're jumping data centers in the ocean. <laughs> What do you what do you mean? I mean, it's the ocean. It can soak it up. Come on. <laughs> All right, we're moving on. All right, <laughs> moving on. Moving uh, on. This one's in my backyard, and I know a little bit about this one. So, uh, new Colorado breach notification rule signed into law. So, uh, Governor Hickenlooper signed one of the most stringent uh, breach notification laws um, in the country. Mm -hmm. I knew this was coming. We we actually did a session on this in Denver. 
a couple months back and we had a lawyer come in i'm not one uh kind of telling us he said look this is this will be one of the most stringent breach notification laws it supersedes federal uh 30 days no excuses once the breach has been identified and so now um colorado's kind of gone out and said look we're setting the bar around um customers as it was uh, passed bipartisan so both both sides of the chambers uh passed this but it supersedes any of the federal 60-day notifications for HIPAA and some of those other ones. So uh, this will be interesting to watch to see how this plays out a little bit. But uh, I thought this was a really interesting story now that it's been passed. It'll it'll spend some time in court. Go ahead. What, may may I just mechanism? take a quick sidebar? In yes, terms Your Honor. Of breach notification. I, d I don't know if we if, if it came up on other episodes because I've missed a couple. But you know, uh, Chili's was recently in the news for reporting a data breach and i actually read an article where somebody was complaining or people were complaining that they had reported the breach too quickly that they didn't have enough details mm. and i i kind of thought really <laughs> is, that, is that where we're going <laughs> uh you know i i would like to applaud chile for their for the fact that a they they know they noticed something and it happened they noticed it relatively quickly from what I remember, it's been a couple of weeks since I read the article. They they notify they they noticed the breach, and a they noticed it themselves. Not law enforcement knocked on their door, and b they did it within you know days or weeks, which is pretty damn good. And and they immediately or you know pretty quickly notified the public of what was going on. So my hats off to them for doing that. I I don't think we want to get into a game of uh how you know okay you have to report quickly but how quickly is too quickly right if you haven't had a chance to do the investigation the forensics to find out really what's going on i mean i think the the purposes of this is to let people know that look your credit card data your whatever is out there take precautions um so yeah. do i really need to know all the details of the breach to notify customers? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how some of this plays well, out. I mean, it's nice to be notified because if uh, if I if they lost my credit card, I would like to know that sooner rather than later. I mean, I don't have to know exactly how it was compromised and, and who got it and all these other pieces to know maybe you should go cancel that stupid thing yep, before get you, you get a bunch of phone calls from the creditors. So I'm glad they're pressuring people to notify because I'm sure corporate legal and corporate everything is always about, oh, well, let's take another couple of weeks until we really understand, you know, and you know, always just, you know, keep worrying about it. And plus, everybody will forget about it by then. Yeah. Well, they hope. But, but that well, begs, the, begs question. the question, who would want to know, uh, it's somewhat rhetorical, who, who would want to know the details or who would be upset that there's no details provided in the breach? I can think, I think of immediately media because they want to have a story to write, and and sales and marketing for all the vendors out there, because they want to be able to update their use case and hopefully sell more stuff. But are there other legitimate, uh, you know, groups that would want to know the details? Well, it should be nice to know what happened, so other people could take action to stop it from happening again. Yeah, and if that comes out later, I'm okay. Yeah. But as a consumer, I'd I'd just cancel my credit card. I'll go get another. Yeah. One, right. I I I, so I don't know. I think they're they're I have a higher level question. Yeah. Which is, at what point is this almost like prison being the deterrent to crime? Because it really feels like, to a, lar a large degree, um, they're asking for companies to, first of all, be able to detect the breach within that time frame, have some sort of response to it, and then notify all of their customers. And by the way, that means identifying all the customers affected uh, within that time frame. And it feels like a punishment to companies that perhaps are getting breached. And let's face it, Breaches are happening more often than not, uh, and companies just aren't able to keep up in large part anyway. It, it almost feels like it's a punishment for a crime that hasn't been yet committed, but the companies can never keep up on this, and it's just going to eat up more of their budget on security, which, by the way, at some point, the company needs to be focusing on what the business is, not security. Yeah, but I could flip that around and say the punishment also means that that if people take their business elsewhere, it encourages companies not to get caught up in this. I mean, if 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 I see somebody gets breached over and over and over again, I'm a lot more cautious about going down there and using my stuff and as a consumer 
So maybe that's the kind of kick in the ass that, that some companies need to do something about this Remember, instead of just saying there's no consequences, yeah, so the, why fix it? And the 30-day kicks in when they know. Look, we all know that it's a couple hundred days before anybody knows they've been breached. Well, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a whole other valid conversation here about why does it take us six months to identify a breach in the first place? But this law specifically, once you know that a breach has happened, you've got 30 days to notify customers, yeah. right? Um, well, so that's, that's why I was saying hats off to Chili's because uh, my recollection, and I'm fuzzy on the dates, but they suspected the breach happened in like April, beginning of May, but they sent out their notification somewhere around May 15th. So it happened pretty darn quickly. Now, ironically, you know, I'll bring up PCI again. Within PCI, if, if you're an organization that suffers a breach, you're supposed to notify the card brands within 30 days. That, that's the rules within PCI. Uh, and a couple of years ago with Home Depot and Target, there was legislation put out there to you know, do breach notification for the consumers. I don't know that it ever passed, but you know, that was the big brouhaha for a while. But you know, I think like this notification law, and I think a lot of the breach notification laws are consumer focused, so that you know, like you were saying, you know, I want to know if my data has been compromised as a consumer, so I know to keep my eyes out on my credit card activity, my banking statements, you know, just, you know, see if somebody's trying to, you know, steal my identity. That that's what is trying to be accomplished with these breach yeah. laws. And, and at least it makes them have a policy. I, I mean, you know, they don't just immediately when something bad happens, they start scrambling with the lawyers and all the lawyers get in a room somewhere with the CEO going, what do we tell and who do we tell it to? And maybe we shouldn't tell anything. And, and can we lie? And, and should, you know, should, let's just not release anything for a while and see what happens and right. maybe it'll blow over. Yep. Yep. This, and, it, it, and I would actually argue as well here that honestly, though, uh, I don't think that the normal consumer cares about the breach. And, and the reason I say that is because we can look at recent situations with Facebook, right? Like they just recently had that uh, article come out that said that they had been releasing data to Huawei, uh, including those like kind of second order connections to friends who had private uh, set or privacy settings at the most strict, but basically having all of their data siphoned off as well. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't think that the everyday consumer's habits are going to change as a result of a breach. They get their card replaced by their bank and they move on. Yeah, but they need to know that. They need themselves. to know that because I, I, average consumers, I, I would really like it if if my father, who is not an expert on this, who's 80 plus years old, got notified quickly and they said, be advised your credit card's been compromised and you may receive contacts from third-party actors who are going to use this information to try to do these things to you. I, I mean, he would at least know then to maybe be aware of these phone calls coming in because I we get these spear phishing attacks all the time. They're very, they're very insidious. They're very tricky. And when they have that kind of information, I, I had one today and I talked to the guy. He was calling me saying that uh, he could get me prescriptions. And he said, uh, he had my name, so he, I mean, he probably got of the phone book, but he was like, hey, Doug, you know, if you've got any prescriptions, we got a way to get this. It's a CVS 30th annual uh, anniversary. Uh, and, and I said, wow, can you get me oxys? And he said, yes, I can. I said, could you get me a thousand Oxycons? And he said, yes, for $1,000. I need your, your credit card information. But I'm like, if I know that my stuff's been compromised, I can at least be on the lookout for this. And, and I think for average consumers, yeah, they don't care about the breach. They don't care about the intricate details. They just need to be advised that something bad has happened and you may end up suffering for it. Yeah. And, you know, credit card's one thing, but I mean, medical records. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of other things that could be a lot more disastrous if you don't know somebody's well, got that information. That's the spear phishing thing because you, yeah. call, you call somebody and give them like their doctor's office his phone number and it's like hi i'm calling from doctor you know yes uh, my doctor's my old doctor's name actually was doctor yes and i used to call him doctor no all the time and, and he didn't <laughs> no. find that, he didn't find that amusing at all but uh but i mean you know the idea that it's very easy to spearfish people when you have those little tidbits and you can just make that story that much more plausible and and i think notifying people that we have lost all your records quickly at least makes you prepped for that kind of spearfishing attack even if you don't have a lot of grim details i i i like it yep all right let's go to the next one uh this one will be fast flash zero day exploit act now Really? Who uses Flash? Let's just ask that. Who <laughs> no, is the, still using Flash? Here's the action. Stop using Flash. <laughs> I, thought, I thought they changed the name of Flash to Flash Zero Day Exploit. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> it's just like officially called that now. So now there's another Zero so Day. So was, was that a news Flash? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my. Every time this comes up, I'm like, well, 
Well, of course. <laughs> yeah. They are uh, saying it's being abused in the wild, so... Yeah, this, is, one, this know, one's actually an exploit, place. yes. This one is not just a vulnerability. The exploit exists. It's being exploited. So stop using Flash. Oh. Or at least <laughs> disable it until you need it, and then only use it on a very limited fashion. I know, but gosh, there's so much of it still well, out there. It's crazy. It is crazy. I mean, there's so many... I, mean, I can't believe how many sites you go to every day. I, you know, it's like, oh, you must enable Flash to use this. I'm like, well, you know what? I'm going to pass on your site and just move on, and I'll go somewhere else and get my information. Yeah, hey, uh, app guy, <laughs> come on. you got to have some tips in this I, one, right? I, I was going to say, I've ironically only ever seen Flash required on... Things that I bug bounty hunting for, and those tend to be sites with a copyright notice of 2013 or earlier. Uh, by the way, you would be surprised how many companies still have sites under their, uh, you know, their registered IP space that still are up by the IP address. Mm -hmm. But if you try to go to any sort of URL, they're dead. So basically, their deprovisioning process is totally borked. Yep, they don't understand that. Actually, I, I've I've had that conversation with even like pretty you know like C level employees going like you do understand that like the IP is what is still there and you've got these servers because we were doing scans on a company once that we we're working for and we found all these servers and, and that were still running and they didn't even know what they were. You know, I was like, what is this? It's a Unix server. Where is it? And they're like, I don't know. And we actually found one that was in somebody's house that they had taken off site and they didn't even work there anymore. And they still had it up and running. It was on the internet. Wow. And yeah. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, there's customer data on this. And they were like, oh, that, that shouldn't be happening. But nobody can get to it, right? And I was just like, oh, no, of course not. Because it, it's not called foo.bork.com <laughs> anymore. Oh, great. Uh, probably running Flash, too. Yeah, probably. <laughs> customer data with Flash. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, Flash. Be Flash surprised. brought to you, Bry. Yeah, Flash. <laughs> Flash zero day exploits. Brought All right, to you these next two kind of link a little bit together. Um, the first one is what happens if IoT security doesn't get solved. Um, uh, that's probably a, a really the Earth melts. Good one. Does yeah? I mean, this is. I think this is a challenge. No one's really figured out well. It. it I think this is going to be. Kind of, you know, they're talking about, you know, adoption slowing down because of the security issue. It, adoption's not slowing down. We keep throwing this crap on our network all the time. Yeah, but this is this is the same life cycle that we went through from like there was a time when the mainframe, you know, I was I was absolute, you know, I was I controlled everything. There was nothing that I did yep. not control absolutely. And then here come these, you know, people from the University of Minnesota or wherever saying decentralized computing will solve all the world's problems by placing a computer on each desk that is not connected to other computers and allowing the users to support their own operations will eliminate the need for mainframe operators. And then we just sat down in the mainframe room with cigars going wait for the phone to ring and they're like hi uh what does it mean when it says my computer's been stoned that was the first virus i ever saw it was called stoned and i'm like i have no damned idea uh you should be using the mainframe so bite me <laughs> and you know and it was it didn't take long before somebody started figuring out we need to we now we need to rope all that in let the wild west in and we're just in that wild west phase of iot where it's all crazy and all this stuff's out there and then slowly you're going to have to rein that back in because that was the promise of iot it's like take control of your world put up thermostats that can talk to you turn alexa loose with all your secrets this sex robot can also clean your house and all and clean itself in the dishwasher no problem which really just sounds awful <laughs> but sorry i'm getting all carried away but but uh, but i mean those life cycles kind of go you know they, they follow that what so did, did any of you guys catch the um the announcement from microsoft a few weeks ago about the azure sphere uh, that they're launching or that they've released no yeah. i missed that one which one uh azure sphere so it, yeah so it's it's not in the show notes today paul and i talked about this two maybe three weeks ago on application security weekly so it's interesting because iot by itself is definitely a hard problem because it's the race to the bottom effect right the cheapest possible hardware the cheapest possible software which tends to be open source and is like 10 or 15 versions behind uh so it's rife with vulnerabilities and what microsoft is coming out with and i believe we actually have an interview lined up here in a few weeks uh here on pulse security weekly for uh, azure sphere which is both uh, an ecosystem where they've developed a chipset with a custom Linux uh, installation that talks back to a cloud environment that's in Azure. Uh, and then it does things like verification of the BIOS or the firmware. Mm -hmm. It does uh, like checks on code signing for the things that the thing is supposed to be running. It, it And it's got something like a 
10 year like long term support associated with it. And I feel like finally, finally, companies are, are going to have an opportunity to build an IoT device that is inexpensive to develop, supported through a cloud platform, and by the way, pretty darn secure. Uh, and, so yeah, and I, and, and that's the same, yeah. th but that's the same thing from that decentralized world because that was exactly what happened with that. I mean, it's on a bigger scale than IoT because IoT is cheaper, but the idea was the very same thing. Take this PC, put it on somebody's desk. It's cheaper. It's it's better than the mainframe. It uses the cheapest crap hardware we could buy anywhere. And over time, we started seeing the implementation of things like Novell and other products that came out to kind of lay a blanket over the top of that and control it. So that, that sounds like what this Azure Sphere idea is is, is a, let's make it homogeneous. Let's start getting rid of bad products and, and using good products. And, and the market sort of eventually puts a blanket down over all that. And then you'll have something hopefully. to. I, yeah, you know. I think the question is, is will people adopt that route or will they keep doing the same crap that they're doing? Well, they'll have to. They'll get hosed. Could be. And, you know, it'll be the people sitting out there running flash that are getting smoked. And they'll be going, no, my IoT will never change. We'll leave it the same way it always was. Oh, wait, something just quit. You know, and, and, yep. and so if you can put those kind of umbrellas and blankets over that IoT sphere in your environment, you can start to say, we don't use these non-certified products anymore. And, and some people will. Yep. But, some will. But, but you know, they always will. It doesn't matter how good everything is. Somebody will always go, this is better because it's cheap. And then they get hosed. People will use Android forever. <laughs> Let's put it up. There. And Flash. <laughs> and Flash, obviously. <clears throat> and then the one that ties into this a little bit is researchers successfully hacked in-flight airplanes from the ground. Now, you know, the, the you know Chris Roberts did this um, on mm -hmm. the United flight, actually hacked in. I, I Chris is in Denver with me, and, and so I know the story well because, you know, he got a lot of flack for that. But this is, they're on the ground. Yeah. They hacked into the satellite system, got into the Wi-Fi, yep. got into the systems of the plane. This is pretty freaking scary stuff oh yeah and then he's gonna show yeah, this you, off at black hat yeah although you i got one ticket into an airport and then you just walk in and suddenly you've got hundreds if not you know more than hundreds depending on the airport uh at your disposal right like this is uh, a problem that paul and i talked about a few weeks ago actually because i don't know if it was dhs but it was at least one of the red teams inside of the federal government that did just the same thing they, they basically hacked a, a plane that was on the ground in a terminal uh they didn't say how they did it they didn't say what they hacked this is the in-flight entertainment system if i'm not mistaken right. but the thing that they uh, the, the argument that the government made that really grinded my gears or ground my gears here was uh, they basically said it costs a million dollars per line of code and a year to change. So therefore, it's too expensive to change as if, you know, the 300 plus lives per flight plus, you know, times number of flights per airport wasn't going to be justifying the cost of that change. Yeah, I yeah. And but just just to be fair, uh, I, it's a huge problem. I agree. But it's also those systems, in my understanding, are isolated from the control systems of the aircraft. So those are two separate networks. They are now. They weren't originally. I mean, this is oh, what were. Chris proved out when he was on the flight, is that he actually... He could see some of the systems, He was. Yeah. He actually changed the, the flight in, in air. On the computer, yeah. Yeah, he was in the plane, used the Wi-Fi system through the entertainment system, and got into the cockpit controls and actually... Did something. That's why he got in so much trouble yeah, for that one. Yeah, because you know, right? Oops. And and so I, I I think there is now isolation between those networks because of that. So hopefully, if this is in the satellite link and can only get to the entertainment Wi-Fi, great. But how much of that satellite system is being used to send telemetry back on yeah. all the operations of the plane? Right. And and what all's in there? So yeah, yeah. I mean, there's absolutely some issues there. I mean, I. I, I'm concerned about it. I'm not as concerned if they can't get to the control systems and and ultimately, theoretically, anyway, the pilots are are you know saying the flight computer's telling us to point the nose at the ground. You know, maybe we shouldn't do that. Right. But but I mean, yeah, there's. I mean, and they do put the plane on autopilot, and there's a lot of concerns about this. Auto takeoff, so, auto land. I mean, <laughs> so what, yeah. What movie was it where the bad guys like you know futzed with all the you know hacked into the the die the hard. Air, Air traffic control and and That's made everything you know think they were a hundred feet up yeah, was, higher. Was that Die Hard? It was Die Hard two, two or three. I can't yeah, remember which one. one. It was Die Hard two, two or three. It was Die Hard three, snakes on a plane or something like that. Yeah. No, I think it was two, but yes, that's the one. Yeah, they so were this doing. Actually, kind of feeds into the story I picked out about container ships. Um, 
they talked about the exact same thing. I, yeah. I, I saw this link about the planes. They're talking about SATCOM communications, and that's how they're talking about getting into these planes. And then I'm reading this article about container ships, mm-hmm. and they're getting into them using SATCOM yep. again. Um, and in this case, they are doing stuff like, um, you know, they said one example was they they uh, got into a system that was sitting there in, at harbor, but they they changed the spoof the GPS from within the ship via uh-huh. SATCOM and put them across the harbor as far as their instrumentation was conv- concerned. Um, yep. And, th- and I, they would, did s- I would be scared of those kind of d- devices because those kind of isolated units like ships and things that were there, like, oh, we're out at sea. Who could cause any problems? Right. That's, I think, a lot of times where they really do under-engineer the security because they just don't think about that. And, and this only propagates when we think about autonomous cars and other things where decisions are yeah. done in the car or in the train or in the boat or wherever it is. I mean, these types of attacks get a little scary when you think about self-driving cars uh, yeah, it, or a know, shipload the, of natural gas, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. a tanker full of they, oil, or well, forget they the tankers. I mean, the, uh, the typical. The, t- I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, one of the things they talked about here that was a problem is that the 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 new seamen basically are coming in. They're getting too used to trusting their instruments. They'll stay head yeah. down on these instruments and not look up really to see what's going on. Pilots too. And, these things don't react fast. <laughs> right. Pretty much humanity. Yeah. Pilots are the same way. I mean, those oh, yeah. planes are so automated now. Takeoff, landing, it's, it's, it, it's so much automation there that if you're not paying attention, something's wrong, you got to act fast yep. to get yourself out of that situation. Yeah, I mean, when I, when I was taking uh, flight, flight training, I remember I got in one time and I had this different instructor and he was like an old guy. And I started setting up Loran, which tells you how long ago this was. But I was setting up the Lorans, and the minute we took off, the guy reached over and he turned all the Lorans off. And, and I was like, well, what are you doing? And he was like, well, those just failed. What are you going to do now? I mean, and I was fine, but I mean, he was yeah. already... But today, you got so much stuff in there, even in just private planes. It was in a private plane, and I was looking at all the stuff this guy had. And, and it was like, you don't need to look out. It's like, you know, he's just like, he's got like artificial everything down here, and he's just like, you know... I use right. Waze in my plane. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Google. <laughs> Google, Google Maps. Google Maps. Hey, it's like, welcome to the 737. I've, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. You know, with all the technological advancement and innovation and applications of the technology, are we reaching the limit of its utility? Are we getting to these sort of, you know, no-win scenarios where it just doesn't make sense to use the technology? Until we come up with a way to secure it. Flash driven sex robots. Yet. <laughs> yeah, but we're humans. We're lazy, so we want to use it. Yeah, I know, and it's fun. Yeah. All right, you guys got any more stories? Because I'm done. Y'all good? All good. I'm good. All right. Thanks, everybody. We're going to take a break, and then uh, we're going to do the pre recorded interview with uh, John Kinsella at Laird Insight next. Thanks for watching.